Hi, I'm Max Kaiser, and this is the Kaiser Report. You know, those bankers, they're getting squeezed from two sides. Number one, the Basel Committee wants to raise the reserve requirements, thus putting a lot of the Ponzi scheming out of business. They are resisting that reform. And then you've got the law. You've got Interpol trying to chase down some of these corrupt bankers, principally in Iceland, of course, at the beginning of the whole deflationary collapse around the world and Iceland's bankers introduced to the world the poster children for kleptocratic banking, bankster, nightmarish, thieving, larcenistic, no goodniks. Let's get all the political angles, political analyst Stacey Herbert. Max Kaiser, well, first we'll start with the Basel requirements. Shares rise over delay in changes to banks' capital. So yes, Basel has gone easy on the poor bankers. They won't need to meet these alleged reserve requirements until 2019. But as we know, Max, there will be no financial system left by then anyway. Well, the Basel Committee is right to raise the reserve requirements for the global banking system. That's the only way to restore integrity into the global banking system. Effectively, what that means is that banks that engage in fraudulent derivatives packaging and fraudulent arbitraging between 0% interest rates and the free money given to them by the government won't be able to steal as much money as they're currently stealing. I mean, the Basel Committee is correct, but the lobbying effort by uh, folks in the banking industry that have taken control of the U.S. government, the U.K. government, the Western European government is very strong. So the Basel Committee, if they really want to introduce some reform, they're going to have to maybe bring in Tony Soprano or <laughs> some other mafia like mafioso to break some legs because they're not going to willfully shut down their kleptocracy just because the Basel Committee thinks, well, maybe you guys should play fair uh, for once. And you also mentioned Interpol after bankers. Now, we on this program issued a reward, offered a reward to find this Kalpthing Bank um, former uh, chairman who's on the run, hiding out in London. But today, former Iceland PM faces trial over bank collapse. So Icelandic lawmakers have concluded, after an 18-month investigation, that the country's former prime minister, Ger Hard, ought to be tried for economic negligence for his role in the banking collapse and the currency collapse. That's right. We learned from the Nuremberg trial that uh, you can't use as your defense simply that you were taking orders. The fact that the prime minister was simply taking orders from Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and the Wall Street bankers does not exempt him from the law. Uh, the banker you talked about, I believe, Sigurdur Einarsson, uh, was uh, the uh, Icelandic banker that we rewarded a solid gold Krugeran. Uh, if anyone found uh, and led to the arrest of this Icelandic kleptocrat, I'm upping that now today. If you send us a video of him getting a cream pie in the face, uh, he's believed to be somewhere in the U.K., I'm upping it to two gold Krugerrands if you send me that video for an exclusive here on the Kaiser Report. Icelandic banker getting cream pie in face. In Iceland, the currency collapsed by 80 percent. The three banks, the major banks, collapsed. And the, this committee, which is being called in Iceland the Truth Commission, um, found that the three billionaire owners of the three Icelandic banks, uh, Gleitner, Landis Banking, Kaupthing, uh, were so close to the politicians that the politicians and the regulators failed to regulate them. <laughs> well, you know, the Icelandic banking scandal is really beautiful, you know, as far as uh, Ponzi schemes go. I mean, these three billionaire bankers you speak about, they got the banks to lend them billions of dollars to buy shares in the banks. Mm -hmm. And then the stock price of these banks went higher, and then they used the stock price as collateral to borrow more billions uh, to buy more uh, of the bank's shares, and you created this virtuous cycle or daisy chain or Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme, however you want to describe it. It's, it's fraud, and of course they're right to want these guys to face justice because, after all, they've totally destroyed the corona, they destroyed that economy, and the economy is facing severe austerity measures because of autocratic, kleptocratic, bankster, criminal 
shysters. Well, the, the economy, the government did have to borrow $10 billion from the IMF, and it's a population of 300,000. Now, for his part, the headline reads, Iceland's ex-premier defends his innocence in 2008 bank crisis. <laughs> Gerhard says, an innocent person isn't afraid of having his affairs reviewed by an independent and impartial court. My official acts as prime minister didn't cause the banking collapse. It wasn't in my power or in the power of other ministers to prevent it. Well, like I said, just following orders is no defense. I mean, just because the Goldman Sachs bankers and the Wall Street bankers told you to to rape and pillage the finances of your country doesn't make you innocent. Now, hopefully, and we know some parliamentarians up there in Iceland, uh, they will uh, get to this guy before, you know, a tribunal and uh, e eke out onto him the punishment that he fully deserves. Well, then let's go over to the U.S. from whence all of these banking crimes start. Don't repeat history. So this is Timothy Geithner, <laughs> who oversaw the whole collapse of the U.S. banking system. But let's look at the situation overall in America, where they stand now after their banking collapse, where nothing has been done to pursue the banking criminals. U.S. poverty on track to post record gain in 2009. The number of people in the U.S. who are in poverty is on track for a record increase on President Barack Obama's watch, with the ranks of working age poor approaching 1960s levels that led to the national war on poverty. Well, the Geithner, you see, is completely incorrect in his assessment of the problem, and his remedies are completely counterproductive. He believes that he can keep flooding the system with more fiat money credit and that they're going to fake it until they make it, that at some point, uh, if they keep flooding the system with more of this fake debt-based money, that it'll catch a, a big ride up on some newfangled technological innovative swing in GDP and that they're going to be able to pay off all their debts over time. And that's exactly the kind of thinking that got them into this current crisis. Geithner, Bernanke, Obama have to bite the bullet. They've got to realize that the real estate market is really priced at about 60 percent higher than it really is worth. The banking system needs to throw up some real failures. Like Citi, Citigroup is a prime example. That is a technically walking dead zombie bank. They need to basically let that dead corpse die, bury it, take the hit, take, let the economy take the hit and move on. There's, there's no way they're going to massage their way out of this dilemma. Geithner is completely wrong. Furthermore, he's irresponsible. He's condemning the economy to a, a nation, as you point out, the, the, the unemployment rates are skyrocketing, the poverty rates are skyrocketing, because Geithner simply refuses to accept the fact that the economy needs to purge itself of the kleptocrats. Well, exactly. And according to this article, now 45 million people in America, or more than one in seven, was in poverty last year. That's almost 15 percent of the population. So, um, you know, the example of Iceland is that immediately these guys the country stood up, forced their government out, then said the entire banking system is fraud. And we've talked about that as, for the U.S. example. It's 100 percent fraud. You have to say, let's shut the entire banking system down because it's all fraud. There's no fixing it. It's fraud. And now they're prosecuting. There is no exemption. You're the prime minister. You're going to jail. If you help these guys get away with destroying our banking system, you're going to jail. So the same with Bush, the same with Hank Paulson, all the people that aided and embedded the, the criminals in America, Timothy Geithner, Larry Summers, all of these people should be potentially facing uh, their own investigations. Oh, absolutely. Summers and Geithner, certainly. They were carried over from the Bush administration. Barack Obama gave those those cancerous, lecherous kleptocrats oxygen to keep breathing, to keep breeding, to keep performing uh, malevolent actions against the economy, against the folks in America. And as a result, Obama's a one-term president. I'll make that prediction right here. Now, the one thing that is not being spoken about in America is all, so you have all of these poor people. You are not allowed to help them. However, the one thing that you can always keep on spending on is the warfare state defense cut threat to special relationship. Apparently, inflicting deep cuts on the armed services 
could threaten the special relationship between Britain and the U.S. This is President Barack Obama's Defense Department has issued warnings to the Defense Department of David Cameron's government, saying they better not cut their defense spending because they're threatening to cut it from 2 percent of GDP to about 1.7 percent. Well, the warfare state is key. And now let's talk about poetry in the news space. The day after the 9-11 recognition of the anniversary of 9-11, 19 of the hijackers, of course, were Saudi, the news comes out that Obama sells tens of billions of dollars worth of defense contracts of uh, weapons of mass destruction to Saudi Arabia. Now, that's a beautiful uh, juxtaposition. All, that's really all you need to know about this global economy. Obama and the folks who run America Take that defense money and they say to you, Fungu, you can die in the mud because we got plenty of money coming in for killing people, baby. That's pretty much the entire economy in a nutshell. Well, here's a possible answer to helping the U.S. economy, and that's looking to Japan, the other zombie economy that has been in a deflationary spiral. But if you look at the next headline, you see that it actually could have been a whole lot worse over the last 20 years if it were not for real zombies. Thousands of Japanese centenarians may have died decades ago. Huh? So remember, the deflationary collapse in Japan started 20 years ago. Well, according to new um, information from the Japanese government, more than 230,000 Japanese people listed as 100 years old cannot be located and may have died decades ago, according to a government survey. More than 77,000 people currently listed as still alive in Japan, are actually aged over 120. And there's 884 listed as over 150. So these people are still collecting pensions. And they think that it could be a big pension scam where, you know, families are still claiming the pensions for these people. But imagine, you know, this legendary savings culture of Japan. Of course it's a savings culture because these people are collecting pensions, but they're dead. They can't spend it. My oh my. Uh, this sushi sure tastes like grandma. <laughs> Stacy Herbert, thanks so much for being back on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more after the break, so stay right there. Observe nature and discover its beauty. Communicate with the wild and learn. Test yourself and become free. See what nature can give you on RT. Hungry for the full story? We've got it firsthand. The biggest issues get a human voice, face-to-face -face with the newsmakers on RT. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to talk with Nicole Foss, who writes under the name Stone Lee at the Automatic Earth blog. And Nicole is currently on the road in sunny Detroit, speaking to crowds about the coming deflationary depression and peak oil. Nicole, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. All righty, Nicole, tell us about the deflationary collapse you see coming. How is it different to what we have already seen? Oh, I think what we've seen is really only the opening uh, salvo, if you like, uh, phase one of the credit crunch. And there is so much more to come to the downside. You know, we, we really haven't begun to see what's going to happen, although to some extent people where I am now have begun to see an awful lot more of it than, than in some other parts of the world. When we listen to folks like Tim Geithner, Ben Bernanke, Larry Summers, they seem to be mouthing platitudes of an orthodoxy, economic orthodoxy. A lot of it comes from Milton Friedman. A lot of it comes from what's called the Chicago School of Economics. But that mantra, that repeating of the same orthodoxy, is not, is not working. I mean, they, they, they want the crisis to fit their orthodoxy. But let's talk about this deflationary collapse. Uh, you see it as being a global collapse. And will it be more severe in other areas versus, uh, you know, in different areas? I think it will vary enormously. In fact, I think Europe will be hard hit sooner than than the states because there are so many problems with the financial contagion of sovereign debt risk. I mean, starting with Greece, but 
so many European peripheral countries are in just as bad a state. And I, I think it's entirely possible that you could see the, the Eurozone uh, get a lot smaller than it is. If, you, if that happens, what I think you're very likely to see is actually capital flight from Europe. And the states might benefit from that for, for a year or two on a knee-jerk flight to safety as being the least worst option. And uh, also with the, the uh, dollar-denominated debt deflation, because there is more dollar-denominated debt than any other kind, you are likely to see demand for dollars created as, as that deflates. So I think the U.S. dollar could actually do quite well, and the U.S. may have no trouble selling its, its bonds for a period of time. After that, however, all bets are off. When you're talking about economic orthodoxy, I mean, yes, they're monetarists. That, that really is the, the problem. Monetarists don't recognize the critical role of credit in credit expansion that create excess claims to underlying real wealth, and that really is the source of the problem. If you're looking at it only in terms of conventional money supply measures and treating an economy as if it was a machine, if you push this button or pull that lever and this will happen, they're attempting to take the human beings out of the system to make it sound much more mechanistic than it is, and that is absolutely not how markets work at any time. Markets are messy and irrational and emotionally driven, giant swings of, hu of human hurting behavior. And giant expansions really are credit expansions. It's the expansion of human provinces, the broadening of money, if you like, further and further away from anything that constitutes underlying real wealth. And if you really look at the role of credit, that tells you where deflation is going to come from, because deflation is the messy and chaotic extinguishing of excess claims to underlying real wealth. All right, let's move on to peak oil. The uh, International Energy Agency, uh, I believe it's called the IEA, uh, they recently are talking about global demand for oil continuing to rise, uh, whereas production of oil uh, seems to have peaked out. Uh, certainly the cheap oil, the, the oil that's uh, relatively cost effective to get out of the ground, we've gone past that point, and now all the oil to be found going forward is going to be considerably more expensive. Uh, I hope I didn't blow the answer there, but uh, peak oil... Uh, uh, is, is that your uh, working definition of peak oil? And talk, talk a little bit about it. Well, essentially, peak oil is a production maximum. It's not a reflection of how much oil is or is not under the ground. It's what can you extract. And so you have to look at net energy, energy returned on energy invested, which is falling off a cliff, essentially. If you get to the point where the energy returned on energy invested is one, in other words, you put a barrel of oil in and you recover a barrel of oil's worth of energy, at that point, you no longer have an energy source. It doesn't matter how much oil is left under the ground, you can't get it. And the reason that energy return on energy invested is falling so sharply is that we cherry picked the easy, cheap things to get at. And we have now, now left the difficult and expensive fraction where people are working in the deep offshore and looking to work in the Arctic and working in, say, Iceberg Alley off Newfoundland, for instance. These are areas where the costs of production are very high, not just in financial terms, but absolutely in, in energy terms. So the amount of energy it takes to put in compared to what you get out for these much smaller fields we're discovering today than we did previously, that, that is not looking good in terms of a, of a return on investment in, in energy terms. That, and the net energy crisis comes a lot sooner than the downslope of Hubbard's curve would suggest for gross energy production. Net energy decline is very sharp in comparison. Now, one of the biggest fields in the world, one of the three biggest fields in the world, Cantorell Field in Mexico, showing sharp declines year over year. Uh, also parallel emergence of a narco state, incredibly violent. Is there a connection between peak oil in Mexico and the rise of this narco state and violence that's now spilling over into the U.S.? Oh, I'm quite sure there is. And, and in a number of places where states are, are failing, this, you, you would have to you have to have a certain amount of energy in in a system in order to maintain the level of socioeconomic complexity. And I think failed states are a reflection of the, the wealth that is sucked out of the periphery in favor of the center. And if you if you suck out more than than a certain amount, you leave that state with too little energy to to actually maintain the socioeconomic complexity that that it currently has. And I think they're moving towards a system that's even more elitist than, than it already was. And Mexico was extremely elitist beforehand. But a lot of the power is ending up in the hands of, of the, the drug dealers and, and things rather than any kind, anything that could be regarded as a legitimate power structure. Although I must say the definition of uh, legitimate power structure is rather more flexible, shall we say, in, uh, 
in Mexico than it is in many other places. Anyway, I, I think there's a, there's a staggeringly large amount of corruption, and there really isn't a separation be- between what passes for legitimate government and and the the narco state, if you like. Yeah, and what's really tragic is that with the U.S. economy shrinking so rapidly, when it comes to a trade, let's say selling the guns and, and involved in the gun trade to Mexico, uh, they can't afford not to support the narco state. That's having a whipsaw effect and destroying the border towns in the U.S. because they can't afford to take themselves off the, uh, you know, the free money that they're getting from supporting all the gun sales. Now, you recently said that uh, we have lived in an era of the largest energy subsidies in the history of the world. So talk a little bit about this. Well, fossil fuels are a massive energy subsidy. It's, it's free energy. It's a windfall. We happen to discover this. All other societies prior to ours, have, uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, have lived on an energy income. There is some capacity for energy storage in the form of grain and firewood, but there is nothing remotely comparable to the energy inheritance that, that simply fell in our laps in the form of fossil fuels. And while you can have a financial bubble without a massive energy subsidy, for the reason that bubbles are virtual wealth and doesn't create take as much energy to create something that isn't really there as to create something that is. Nevertheless, if you have a massive energy subsidy, energy does become a very powerful driver for socioeconomic complexity and and for you know, expansion of, of credit. And the likelihood of a bubble increases significantly if you have an energy subsidy as a powerful driver. So we have lived through the largest financial bubble in history, and I don't find it remotely surprising that that coincides with a discovery of, and utilization of a massive energy subsidy. Right. So, again, something that people don't really understand is that the credit bubble is tied directly to this massive energy uh, subsidy, the free income from fossil fuels. And as we now experience peak oil, the collateral essentially that has supported this huge Ponzi scheme of credit is diminishing in real time. So no amount of extra uh, fiat currency creation is going to reinflate the bubble because it's impossible to recreate that fossil fuel, essentially. Is that correct? Uh, yes. However, I would say that bubbles do not, because bubbles do not require an energy subsidy, they do have their own internal dynamics. So I don't regard peak oil as the driver to the downside. I think it was a key driver of expansion. The availability of, of cheap oil was a key driver of expansion. But because bubbles are Ponzi schemes and the, the time frame for changes in the financial system is so much shorter than for changes in energy supply in any case, finance I regard as the key driver to the downside. So I think that actually buys us time in energy terms at the expense of making it worse later on in in energy terms. But I really regard bubbles as simply self-limiting structures that that have to come down. They are a house of cards that that reach a point where the debt that's created in, in a credit expansion is no longer serviceable. And at that point, you are going to get the extinguishing of excess claims to underlying real wealth anyway. So a, a lot of people who work in peak oil really regard peak oil as the, the key driver at, or energy supply as a key driver at all times. I would say because finance has a shorter time frame, there are periods of time, for instance, during cascading collapses in the credit market where it is finance that is the key driver. And, and people who are only looking at peak oil, I think, tend to, to miss that. They look at at, say, the fundamentals and assume that the fundamentals are driving prices. Now, I would argue that's absolutely not the case because prices are driven by perception, not by reality. And I mean, we saw an enormous run up in the, in the price of oil. And I was trying to point out at that time that oil prices were about to fall off a cliff. And people were saying, well, you must not believe in the case for peak oil. And that, that was not the case. It's simply that I was looking at what the price drivers are and what was happening in finance to my mind, was going to be the key price driver, was going to rewrite the energy debate. And people who were assuming it was purely the fundamentals that were driving that debate were assuming oil prices could there only ever go up. I would say when supply and demand are tight, what you're going to get is, is huge volatility. and You're going to get huge swings of, of boom and bust. And, and that's really what we're looking at. We've had a recovery in oil prices, but I think we're going to have another very sharp fall. First on uh, the perception of, of 
having having peaked and moved moved away from that in the very short term, but then falling demand. And I think falling we're going to see very sharply falling demand as we move into depression. When the Soviet Union went into its collapse, I believe their their economy fell by about twenty five percent in one year. And so if if we experience something like that, then that's going to actually create a temporary glut because production is geared to the previous level of demand. That is a recipe for sharply falling prices. However, I would also argue that because purchasing power will be falling faster than price in a deflation, even as prices fall, access to everything, very much including oil, becomes harder. Affordability gets worse even as prices fall. Okay, that right there, what you just said, is the reason why the inflationists, so-called, seem to not get what you're saying. Because they're looking at a relative price rise for stuff where the supply is shrinking, and they're pointing to that and saying, that's inflationary. But they're missing the point that in the background is this huge credit collapse that is causing a net deflationary effect. Absolutely. All right, well, that's all the time for her. I got to cut her off there. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Nicole Foss from the Automatic Earth for being on the Kaiser Report. And uh, we'll have to have you on again, hopefully as soon as possible, because you're one of the few people that we've talked to on the show uh, that actually sees all the moving parts here. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All righty. Well, that's uh, all the time for we have on this episode of the Kaiser Report with me and uh, Stacey Herbert. And I want to thank our guest, Nicole Foss, who writes under the name Stone Lee over there at the Automatic Earth. And if you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.